My name is Carrie Wester. I'm the production editor for the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education, also known as JIMBY. Today I'll be speaking with Erica Davies, ASM's Publishing Ethics Manager, about scientific ethics in research and publishing, trends in research misconduct, and available resources to help ASM members and non-members understand the importance of scientific integrity. Thank you, Erica, for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how it's led to your role as ASM's Publishing Ethics Manager? I was trained in microbiology and immunology. After a postdoctoral fellowship at the NIH, I switched over to science policy and administration. I've always been really interested in how science works, not just in the laboratory, but in the scientific community as well. And scientific integrity is such an essential part of having a functioning, translatable, and trustworthy science to present to the community. As ASM's publishing ethics manager, I provide support to our editors-in-chief of our journals on matters regarding scientific ethics in publishing. Can you tell us what the responsible conduct of research is and give us a little bit of a definition? I'll use definitions as provided by the NIH. Responsible conduct of research is the pursuit of scientific investigation with integrity. I find it easier to look at what responsible conduct of research is not, which is scientific research misconduct which is defined as the fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism mm -hmm. of data um, in either the proposing, performing, reporting, or review of data. You had mentioned a little bit about uh, research misconduct. Can you talk about the issues that you've seen as far as that goes and why you think they occur? I think that most, most of what we see, most of the misconduct that we see actually comes from a lack of education. To give you an example, a lot of the plagiarism that we see occurs from authors who tend to be very junior, who likely don't speak English as their first language. And it's really hard to write in a, a new idea or to reform an idea in a language which isn't native. But I think more serious forms of misconduct occur for the same reason that misconduct occurs in any form in society. Science is really difficult. It can take a long time to get significant data. And at the same time, it's incredibly competitive. Scientific funding's at an all-time low. And everybody in a laboratory is dependent upon scarce resources. So it establishes a culture in which people might actually be encouraged to cut corners or to speed things up at the sake of repetition and verification. So it, over time, people might be more likely to borrow ideas, falsify data, and generally cut corners. Hmm. And is there a difference between conducting yourself ethically in research versus conducting yourself ethically in publication or presentations? Absolutely. Somebody might perform their science in an ethical manner, you know, doing all the correct controls and, and collecting all of the correct data. But then when it goes to actually publishing the information, they might tweak it a little bit such that the, what they're showing leads to false conclusions. And that's really what we're trying to prevent. What kind of issues have you seen in science publishing and why do you think those occur? Well, as I mentioned previously, most of what we see is due to things such as miscommunication among authors, lack of training, and mm -hmm. just general error. Um, for example, one of our major issues is over image manipulation. To give you an example, a scientist might run multiple gels or multiple blots for a series of samples. In presenting that data, they want, might want to cut out um, empty lanes or switch in um, from a different gel where the band looked a little bit prettier. So they might splice out those lanes and put them together in an image that makes it look like a, one single whole complete gel was run. And it's fine to prettify your data as long as it doesn't actually change the results. But that needs to be indicated towards the readership. And it can be as simple as inserting a line between the lanes and including in the figure legend a description of what was done. But scientists need to be transparent in how they created the figure that's there. Excellent. And then you've covered it a little bit, um, but what kind of ethics-related trends have you seen in your role as ASIM's publishing ethics manager? Well, just as technology has led to an increased ability to manipulate figures and duplicate them, it's also led to an increased ability 
to find any kind of manipulation or duplication, both in figures and in text. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've seen is the rise of, of citizen science groups, such as Retraction Watch, who are very concerned with maintaining integrity in the scientific record. At the same time, there's both international and national groups that are providing guidance on these issues. Mm -hmm. And some of those groups are COPE, ICMJE, and CSE. When should scientists start to learn about how to conduct themselves ethically in research and in publishing? As early as possible. It should begin at the undergraduate stage and continue throughout a scientist's career. Also, there are federal regulations that mandate the teaching of responsible conduct in research. Anyone receiving federal funding through the Public Health Service, so those receiving NIH grants or NSF grants, mm -hmm. must provide education on responsible conduct of research to everyone who's working on those projects, and that includes students, technicians, and the primary investigators as well. You mentioned education. What kind of resources are available? Well, ASM has some terrific resources, including Jim B's special edition on ethics. The book Scientific Integrity is in its fourth edition, and ASM Press is coming out with a monograph soon as well. And of course, there's great resources outside of the ASM, including the groups that I mentioned previously. COPE's guidelines on various scientific issues are used worldwide, and ICMJE provides the definitive guidelines on authorship. Also, the Office of Research Integrity at the NIH provides oversight for the federal regulations and provides a lot of information on the type of training that people can use um, to meet those regulations. Great. Well, thank you for taking the time to sit with us today. Thank you so much for having me. You can learn more about Jim B's special ethics issue um, as well as other ASM ethics-related resources on asmscience.org. 